Thank you very much for joining us for this event on determining users' ages online. This event is part of the IT Ethics and Law Lecture Series, co-sponsored by the Markula Center for Applied Ethics and the High Tech Law Institute at Santa Clara University. My name is Irina Raiku. I'm the director of the Internet Ethics Program at the Markula Center. Um, and we have three outstanding panelists who will help us unpack the ethical, legal, and technical implications of this contentious issue. Before we get started, I just wanted to invite you to put your questions in the Q&A, and we will try to get to as many of them as possible. We have an hour in total. Um, so to introduce our three panelists, Eric Goldman is Associate Dean for Research, Professor of Law, Co-Director of the High Tech Law Institute, and Supervisor of the Privacy Law Certificate at Santa Clara University School of Law. His research and teaching focuses on internet law, and he blogs on that topic at the Technology and Marketing Law blog. Dr. Jennifer King is the Privacy and Data Policy Fellow at the Stanford in University Institute for Human-Centered Artificial Intelligence and an information security science, sorry, an information scientist by training. Sitting at the intersection of human-computer interaction, law, and the social sciences, her research examines the public's understanding and expectations of online privacy, as well as the policy implications of emerging technologies. She has been an invited speaker at several Federal Trade Commission workshops, and she also served as a member of the California State Advisory Board on Mobile Privacy Policies. Sarah Krebiel is an assistant professor in the Department of Mathematics and Computer Science at Santa Clara University. Her research spans several subfields of theoretical computer science with a primary focus on data privacy. So I'm going to ask Dr. King to start us off by just setting the context in which we're seeing these increasing calls for age verification online. What's prompting them? What are people concerned about? And what are some of the suggestions that are being offered? Sure. Thank you for having me first off. And I have to warn you all, I'm recovering from COVID, so I may be muting myself to cough, and I apologize in advance for that. Um, so, you know, I think today's session was especially motivated by a new law that uh, was signed by Governor Newsom back in September, uh, which is the California Age Appropriate Design Code. Um, and I can run through that pretty quickly, but um, before I do, uh, you know, the California version of that code is basically a different version um, uh, of the uh, UK's version of the same bill. Uh, the UK passed it first. It's been in effect for the last year, uh, and it is called the Age Appropriate Design Code. Um, and what we're talking about today, I think, is a fairly specific um, attempt to kind of regulate age online, um, as opposed to, I think, a broader set of bills that are much more focused on act regulating content and access to content. I assume those may come up today as well as we're chatting. Um, but the kind of the piece that the design codes are, um, are attempting to do is a really kind of interesting take on, I think it's very different from how we've seen attempts to regulate the internet for kids um, in the past overall. And so uh, I will run very quickly through the California version of this code because it does particularly um, is the you know, motivator for why we're talking about age assurance today. Uh, and I'm actually going to put a quick link in the chat, which I hope you all can see, because um, if you're interested in learning a bit more about this, the Future of Privacy Forum here in the US, US did a great uh, issue brief on the California code. And again, if you're interested in the UK version, you can obviously take a, uh, do a search for um, UK uh, age appropriate design code and that should come up for you as well. Um, but how this is a bit different from kind of other ways that we've been thinking about regulating uh, spaces for kids is that from a very high view, um, this particular bill kind of unites concerns with privacy, um, with the design of platforms that to date have primarily been for adults. Um, even if they've allowed children, uh, the overarching view of these uh, or design or intent of these platforms has really been to service adults and not kids. Um, and so this bill is I think different in that it's really trying to motivate um, both privacy issues as well as a set of design issues around harm. And it also kind of wraps this up in, in age assurance as well. So there's kind of some you know, interesting things going on here. 
Um, it may not have intended to really regulate kind of access to content or access to information. We can debate whether bills like this are going to have that as a side effect potentially. Um, I think that was the primary intent of a different bill that also passed this session in California that I think Eric knows much more about than I do. Um, and you know, there's kind of a whole different set of issues, I think, uh, when we're thinking about kind of regulating access to information and some of the design issues that this bill is bringing up. Um, but it is really focused on, um, on services that are routinely accessed by a significant number of children. Um, so that goes beyond just services that are primarily devoted to children. And you know, this is a way I think at getting at the large platforms like Instagram and Facebook and Snap, um, you know, where there are you know, adult members as well as child members, obviously. Um, it also expands the age um, for what we consider to be a child um, past the current federal level at COPPA, which is 13 up through 17, so up to the age of 18. Um, the kind of big piece to this that we'll be talking about today is the, the desire to want to estimate the age of young users with a reasonable level of certainty appropriate to the risks that arise from the platform's data management practices. And so I think we'll probably get into the weeds of debating what that means. Um, I think Eric's been pretty critical about some of that language, um, but it does raise this question of how are we going to essentially you know, check the ages of users of these platforms in a reliable way and kind of what are the implications of doing so. Um, but in addition to that, this particular bill here in California um, is really trying to be a privacy by design bill. And by, why, by privacy by design, um, what we mean is that essentially the defaults of the platform are set such that they are you know, pro-privacy or to the highest kind of privacy settings. And you know, of course, that's going to vary from platform to platform. But in practice, what that really means is that the defaults need to be such that you know, you're not sharing data by default. Um, you know, if there are privacy settings, they're set to the highest level. There are some very specific implications for location data and collection and gathering uh, with the California bill. Um, and so all of that kind of you know, pushes this, this, um, this kind of design level towards something that is privacy by default and rather than a kind of default level of sharing that everybody is included in and that you basically have to opt out of. And the kind of carrot in this design scenario is that the age regulation pieces, as I understand it, um, don't necessarily hold if you offer the same level of privacy to all of your visitors and not just children. So that's kind of the interesting, from my perspective, um, kind of carrot offered here that you may not have to go through the type of age assurance uh, discussion that we're going through today or you know, measures you know, if you're kind of offering um, privacy by default to all your visitors. Um, there's a few more other quick things I'll just go over. Um, you know, there's an expectation that your policies are very user centric and that includes for kids. And so this has some really interesting implications. If for example, you have to design a privacy policy that speaks to your youngest users. So you know, how do you describe these things to five-year-olds? Um, as well as 10, um, we'll, you know, we can debate whether they even apply to two-year-olds. Um, you know, there's a data minimization um, provision, which basically comes down to that you can't use children's data in a way that's materially de detrimental to them. Um, and then finally, uh, there are requirements for data protection impact assessments. And where I find that to be a really interesting piece, again, from somebody with a, a human computer interaction back form, background, sorry, is that um, those data protection impact assessments are really looking at like the likelihood of potential harms or potential harms on these platforms to children. And beyond, I think the kind of, um, I want to call it garden variety harms that a lot of us have talked about in the space for really 20 years, you know, in terms of like, can kids meet, you know, connect with people they don't know, can adults contact them, you know, those types of features that we see in social media. Uh, it also raises this question of algorithmic harm, and that's one of the pieces I've been particularly interested in, you know, whether the algorithms that currently either feed content or shape your experiences on these platforms by design potentially have negative effects. And so that's the interesting kind of well-being and health or mental health piece of this legislation um, that's also included in here that is really trying to focus on the design of these systems and whether or not the systems themselves are encouraging different types of harms that can go beyond this normal scope of what we think of is, as issue for kids. Um, and a lot of that specifically mentions things like, you know, just designing for engagement, 
uh, rather than kind of designing for, let's say, information seeking, you know, the, the idea of trying to keep you on the platform as long as possible. There have been a lot of discussion in the space around addiction and online addiction and whether these different services encourage addiction. And then finally, of course, then also questions about targeted advertising itself and whether that presents a harm to kids. So um, with that, I will pause and um, happy to you know, talk more about that bill in particular. But again, the, you know, the real crux of the issue for us is that age assurance piece today. Yeah, exactly. So I think that particular bill is one of many examples that we're seeing across jurisdictions of uh, efforts that call for age verification. So I'm going to reel us back to that particular um, part of the bill and um, ask um, Sarah to talk about you know, you know, your work focuses on, on privacy and, and ways in which technology can protect or undermine privacy online. So how do you see the various proposals that have been made of how um, age verification can be done online so far? What are your concerns? Um, and then I know that, um, uh, Eric, you're going to talk more specifically about age verification, and then we can come back to the various proposals as well. Yeah, so, um, I mean, as, as you mentioned, I'm a computer science professor, and so just like a little bit more about my context, my expertise is in differential privacy. Um, that's a very mathematically formal way of looking at data privacy. And I'll probably come back to that like more specifically. I'll, I'll keep it general for now um, as the conversation proceeds. Um, but what that means as far as my perspective is that I'm actually interested not just in what information is being shared and for what purpose, but also what are the implications of that information sharing? What else can you infer from uh, certain pieces of information? potentially like without knowing in advance what tools you're going to have to gather additional information. Um, and so that makes me sort of a privacy skeptic where I, um, I see here's, here's a way where we can, you know, share just a little bit of information. Don't worry, don't be scared about what, <laughs> um, what's going to happen downstream. You say, oh, you should always be scared about what's going to happen downstream. Um, I do generally live in, a, in quite an academic context. This is a really you know, mathematical way of describing data privacy. Um, but I'll also say for, for the sake of kind of describing where I'm coming from and what my background is, I'm spending sort of part time in a more practical context. Um, I'm an academic collaborator at Meta, and so I've been helping them figure out how to adjust both reactively and proactively to existing and anticipated regulations about how to handle da uh, data privately. So um, most of what I've thought about with regards to age verification is just stuff that I've read uh, subsequent being asked to sit on the panel. So I'm certainly not a domain expert in this area like the other two panelists. Um, I think that when it comes to kind of assessing uh, potential benefits and potential harm where the potential benefit is, as Jen was kind of describing is creating a better online experience for minors as well as you know everybody. If a lot of adults are also being harmed by um, you know, various algorithmic features um, where, and where the harm is, well, we don't know what's going to happen if we start collecting more information from people um, than we currently are. And you're collecting more information if you are, um, if you're getting information some way or another about how old your, um, your users are for, for a particular content provider online. Um, and I think that, that uh, we do have to start getting specific in order to weigh those risks and benefits because there are a ton of different ways that you can collect information about how old someone is and um and and the options are limited by whatever the legislation says you have to do um so i would say on one extreme people are talking about uh using uh sort of facial analysis to to you know use a webcam to get information about what what the user's face actually looks like um and and there are ways to make this more or less <laughs> private. Um, there are lots of proposals to say, well, we need to have a, a third party who does this for all of the websites. So the websites aren't actually collecting this information. Um, I think that the, the issue there is it has to be a trusted third party. Um, and, and so I think that if you, know, if, if you can set things up so that such a third party really is a trusted third party and they're not sharing any information except for age is good, age is bad with the content provider, that's maybe okay, but taking um, a photo of somebody that has a lot of information associated with it. And so that's something to be um, skeptical about making sure that that, that uh, strategy is implemented properly. 
Um, another proposal that I've seen, and I think this is less in the context that uh, Jen is talking about, but more in the context of something specific like uh, websites hosting pornography are, are, uh, are required to have age verification at a high level of, um, of kind of efficacy assured. Um, and so a pretty offline proposal that I've read about is that you can have um, these scratch cards that you could buy at like a convenience store or something where they're actually looking at your ID and verifying your age the way they would if you were buying alcohol. And then that has some code that you enter and it's not really attached to you except for the fact that you were the one that went to the store and got it. And so I think that these two things are technically like entirely different. And so we can have entirely different discussions. Um, and then there are many other um, proposals that, that fall somewhere in the middle of those. Before we move on, can you talk a little bit about some of the other proposals like checking ID or, you know, just give give people a sense of uh, a little bit more of the panoply of suggestions. And, and I would ask you, do you feel based on what you've taken a look at so far, do you think that age verification can be done in a privacy protective way? And I know we're going to get more into that later. Yeah, well, I think it depends on the context, um, because I think that if we're talking about um, a website that says only people above this age can access this website, then something like the scratch card um, philosophy, you know, potentially could could work pretty well. So you, you could say, well, there's not total privacy because somebody could watch you walk into the convenience store and sees what you're getting at checkout. Now they don't know where exactly you're going. Um, you know that you need this that you need this certification, but maybe they have an idea that you know that you're that you're going to go view pornography later. Um, so so there there are always any any time you're collecting more information about somebody, there are always privacy risks. I think that the risks there are not very um, severe. I think some other um, some other uh, proposals that I've read about are. Um, credit card validation. So this is also something that either a website could do, or what would be a better privacy, um, a, a better privacy implement, privacy focused implementation would be a third party would do this and then share the the verification with the website that you're trying to access. Um, and so the idea there is you're not necessarily paying for anything, but you know, the, your credit card would be run as though you were paying for something. And, um, and so th then you'd say, okay, well, this person has access to a credit card at least. Um, there's sort of some, some efficacy problems there about whether that's accurate or not. Um, again, this is something where if you trust the third party to not share any more information than they're supposed to share, you can kind of silo there's the person that's getting identifiable information for you or the party that's getting identifiable information for you. And then they're providing a certificate to the websites that, you know, that they're accessing where knowledge that you're accessing those websites could be used to harm you. Um, they're not getting the private information about you. So I think that there are ways to, um, to compartmentalize the information flow in a way that better services privacy. Thank you. And um, I think uh, another proposal I had read about was for companies that already collect a lot of information about what their users are doing to try to just use the already collected information to try to determine the age of the user. And again, there were um, there was yeah. So yes. Yeah, so that's so I think I've seen that as like um, age inference. Um, and and so I actually think that's kind of maybe the scariest of these proposals. Um, and, and there maybe I'll loop back to, to my field of differential privacy, this idea that um, you know, a lot of information that doesn't directly link back to you can indirectly link back to you. And that's actually where the, where the potential for harm is greatest. Um, and so if the privacy strategy is that we are trying to infer extra information about you based on all the stuff that we've collected, then, then the strategy is almost like, like maximizing the possible harm to you. And so I'm, I'm, I'm pretty concerned about that one at face value. Which is really interesting because that's the option that doesn't contemplate necessarily gathering additional information. It basically says this is information we already have, and as you just said, that carries its own set of risks. Um, yeah, and, and I and I do think that if that information that that is already had is sort of in some safe place, then that's fine. <laughs> but the whole point is that it's sort of gathered from a myriad of places that don't necessarily have. Um, 
have an incentive to, to keep that information private. It's sort of like here, anybody who's trying to harm you, let's kind of on purpose aggregate this information that can help them harm you. So um, last but not least, um, Eric, I know you've had um, a lot of concerns about um, this, this, not just specific proposals, but about the issue in general and about its implications. So can you talk about what the critics like you are concerned about and whether you think this is something that where the harms could be mitigated or, um, or, or the proposal of age verification itself is um, untenable in terms of, of, of human rights, let's say. Uh, yeah, I'm going to ultimately tell a dystopian story. So, um, uh, you know, I think we really have to have this heart to heart. What does age verification, age assurance, age inference, what do any of these mean in practice logistically? But I'm, before I do that, I want to take a quick segue down history lane. Um, and then I'm going to come back to show why we're right, right where we were 25 plus years ago, um, but in no better condition, really. Um, so uh, I've been doing internet law for uh, almost 30 years now, um, and very few things are new in internet law. They're just recycled from the old days. And in the 1990s, uh, when the internet was first becoming commercialized, there was proposals and discussions about needing a driver's license to access the information superhighway. The idea was that um, people could engage in pseudonymous um, and age inappropriate activity online uh, because we didn't know who they were. You know, the classic New York time, uh, New Yorker cartoon, nobody knows your dog online. Um, so the, 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 uh, the regulator response was, well, why don't we make people show a driver's license before they get access to the internet to confirm their identity and confirm their age? Um, and as you can imagine, even back 25 plus years ago, people said, well, that sounds like that could be a really horrifying outcome. Um, it's different than the way that we work in the ordinary world. Uh, we go to a library. We're not asked to show our age. We go to a grocery store. We're not asked to show our age before we can even walk in the door. Um, and the idea was that uh, before you could go anywhere on the internet, you're going to have to present this driver's license to authenticate yourself. Um, Good news, that idea didn't come to pass yet, but we have to have the yet because it's exactly what we're doing now. Um, so in uh, 1996, Congress passed a law called the Communications Decency Act that basically required age verification before users would be allowed to access material that's, quote, harmful to minors. Now, as Jen described, um, this bill doesn't quite use those terminology, but basically we're back to exactly what was uh, uh, passed in 1996. We are concerned that kids are gonna have access to things that will harm them. And in order to prevent that, we need to uh, uh, identify, uh, uh, validate their age so that we can keep them safe from it. Um, that law was struck down by the Supreme Court in 1997 as violating uh, the free speech rights. Um, and uh, so the whole proposal um, that we're discussing now basically went dormant for the last 20 so or, uh, years or so because it seemed like it was facially unconstitutional. We already litigated that battle back in 1997. Um, but this, this siren call that we have to protect kids online is a perennial theme of the internet. That's what prompted the Communications Decency Act back in 1996. And that's what prompted the Age of Appropriate Design Code in California in yet another election year in 2022. Um, so this is, you know, uh, that's why I, I'm so glad we're not talking just about California's law because this dynamic is gonna play out across the globe, across this country. Everyone thinks we have to protect the kids online. Let's talk about how to do so. Now, let's talk about the mechanics of what is really involved with, with um, age verification. In California's bill, it's unclear how many websites will be required to comply with this, uh, the initial age uh, vetting before uh, kids are um, um, obligated, uh, before the site's obligated to comply with these heightened burdens uh, in the statute. Um, my take is that most sites are going to have to comply with this law, um, and I'm happy to talk about that more, but I'm assuming that in the end, most of the sites that we go to as users are going to have to comply with this law. So let's talk about what that would look like 
in practice. It would mean before we're able to access a website, that website is expected to say, are you a kid or not? Now, we just discussed what that might look like. That could be done via document uh, presentation. It could be done via facial scans, or it could be done through maybe some other uh, set of uh, technologies. Um, but, but the point is, before we even get to access a website, all of us, both kids and adults, will be required to validate our age to the satisfaction of the site. Now, we don't even know if we can trust that site. We haven't been there enough to inspect to decide whether or not we want to trust it. And it's already asking us for the, the, uh, some very personal information, whether it's documents or the scan of our faces. This is not like uh, you know, a little scrap of data that um, we might be concerned about. These are like very core privacy um, uh, uh, invasive requests. Um, and we'll have to do that at every site that we go to functionally or most of the sites that we go to. So just imagine you're clicking along, puts a link in a social media, you click on it. Nope, sorry, you got to validate your age before you can come in. And over and over again, that will be the user experience that we have. Now, here's the thing that I can't wrap my head around. Um, in order for the kids to validate themselves, they're going to have to present personal information. And then we have this stream of questions about that Sarah was raising. What's going to happen to that information? How do we know that we're protecting the kids? But my concern is much more structural, that when kids are, are going to be asked constantly before they can engage in the internet, um, uh, give me your face. Let me scan your face. Let me check and see how old you, I think you are. Um, what's that going to do to the norms about privacy that, that this generation is going to have and all future generations are going to have, that it is expected that before you can go into the library, you got to scan your face. Before you can go to the grocery store, you got to scan your face. It's like we're saying this becomes an infrastructure that is part of how you simply live your life. And query how governments are going to think about that. Now that you're scanning the face, what can we do to further leverage that existing infrastructure to advance our ability to control how people are engaging with uh, each other? So in a sense, what we would be doing is teaching kids, it's just normal that you have to give up some privacy in order to get uh, to a site that you want, which is exactly the message this, the whole bill is trying not to send. And it would be normal that the government could mandate how that kind of interaction would work. And where is that going to lead us? Um, it becomes a really dystopian type of environment where the government is now invasively um, uh, socializing users to accept privacy uh, uh, um, um, invasions as part of our ordinary da daily life. Um, and uh, the, the final thing I'll say um, regarding um, uh, what we're uh, teaching kids is it is my view that the obligations in the California Age Appropriate Design Code are not uh, possible to comply with. As Jen said, maybe that'll be incentive for the services to give all users, adults and kids, this much heightened uh, standard of privacy. Another possibility is they're just gonna say no thank you um, to the kids. Many kids don't generate that much money for the services. They're a huge burden um, uh, under these laws. So just toss them. And so we're going to be creating an environment where we created this legal incentive for services to make a distinction between kids and adults, to treat kids as if they're non persona non gratis, and to shut down portions of the internet to them. And to me, the future of of um, uh, the you know uh, of our society is teaching kids how to better use the internet, not teaching them that they're pariahs on the internet. So this bill sends this really weird message to all the kids out there: we want you to use the internet less. That is a functional consequence of law, and to me, that doesn't sound like a very good idea. So I'm I want to give all of you a chance to respond to each other. But before before I do, I just want to ask um, Eric if you could respond to two points that I think people might raise. One is that, for example, in the real world and not the online world, uh, we do ask people to show ID at bars or, you know, you mentioned libraries and grocery stores, but there are places where you have to give up some information in order to access the place or the goods. 
Uh, and we do want those places to say, to say no thank you to kids, right? So, so how is this um, different to what's being proposed um, here versus what we do in our regular lives already? And the other thing I wanted you to talk about is I know you've been concerned that this effort to protect children actually harms children specifically, and not just in, in the way that you described, um, but in terms of the kind of information they can access online in general because there are also parental controls required and because we've expanded the age to 18, right? So it covers teenagers' access to information as well. If you could talk briefly about that, and then I promise I will let everybody respond to each other. Um, okay, uh, so um, I'm sorry. Now, remind me, the first one again was... The first the... one was, how is this different than having bouncers at the door at various kinds of places? Okay. Yeah, um, so uh, certainly there are things that we have decided as a society are not appropriate for children, um, you know, alcohol or gambling as two examples, um, where we set up a boundary or perimeter and say, we are going to control kids access to this and we're going to deputize commercial providers like bars or stores um, or casinos to verify the age of their uh, users. Um, the Age appropriate design code and most of the proposals that are coming out today aren't specific to those particular categories of goods and services markets that are intended to be accessed only by adults. They're across the entire internet. And that's a really structural change. And I really think it's helpful to make sure that we don't think that those are comparable at all to say, okay, we're going to restrict cigarettes, alcohol, and gambling um, to saying we're going to restrict everything that people do. If you want to go read Eric Goldman's blog, in theory, I might not say before you can read my blog, you need to, to um, uh, prove your age. Now that kind of change where we go from these very narrow verticals to everything um, picks up too many false positives. It, uh, it creates all these potentials for actually creating barriers for people to access content or services that aren't actually intended to be uh, restricted by age, but functionally will end up becoming so. Um, that's because as I said, the idea is for many businesses, they're just gonna toss kids all together, in which case then they do become restricted items, even though they're not cigarettes, alcohol, or gambling. Um, so uh, the, um, uh, the I just wanna go back to that 1997 case where, where the court struck down Congress's first attempt to, to impose this age verification requirement. And the court said, you cannot reduce the internet for the adults to what's fit for kids. Um, and so it basically said that we are gonna say there are things that it is totally appropriate to um, uh, 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 not uh, impose any age verification at all um, because otherwise doing so would change the nature of the services that are being offered for adults and for kids. Um, so uh, with respect to your second point, um, you know, uh, a lot depends on how age verification is done or age assurance, age um, inference, whatever it is. Um, the, uh, 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 to the extent that um, uh, people are now having to reveal personal information about themselves in order to get access to things that they need in their lives but are sensitive, um, to them, that actually becomes another barrier. All the reasons why we are concerned about protecting privacy when it comes to people um, uh, navigating the world, that they may end up consuming less of the things that they need because in order to get them, they're having to pay this privacy cost that they're not willing to bear. Um, so for example, if you are a trans kid in a sensitive, in an area where uh, you're a target of both the community and regulators, um, you know, presenting your, uh, something like a face scan in order to access a, 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 a content or information that's relevant to you actually provides forensics to confirm that you were the one that went to that site in a way that it doesn't exist again if you walk into just a, a, a building uh, off the street. So I'm going to ask Jen or give Jen a chance. I know you've been patiently listening to everybody and uh, what are your thoughts after this whole conversation? Sure. Um, so, you know, I disagree with Eric's framing um, of, the, of this issue overall. Um, you know, I think that if we do nothing um, and we reuse kind of the same way of 
verifying age that we have for the past 30 years, um, then I do agree with a lot of his concerns. But I think that um, you know the assumption that we should just continue <laughs> kind of the existing way we've been verifying age, um, you know, is a faulty one. I mean, we should not. Um, and so I think to some extent, this really relies on either our ability to innovate in this space and or whether we can develop standards that um, really try to clearly lay out, um, I think, a range of options. And so I don't think that age verification needs to be thought of you know, unilaterally as kind of this high stakes endeavor. I mean, I agree that there are definitely going to be, you know, sites on the internet where it is high stakes, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, pornography um, or buying alcohol where, you know, absolutely you are on the hook. You cannot let anybody under the age of 18. You know, my read of the age appropriate design code, um, of course, the devil will be in the details of how it's actually you know, written into regulation, um, is that it's not as absolute as Eric's been painting it. Um, and I have more faith that we can rely, we can develop um, kind of a range of options that don't skew towards the like, we absolutely have to, without any doubt, verify you, you know, as somebody under a particular age. And, you know, we're going to need as much data from you as possible to do it. Uh, you know, so for example, with younger kids, uh, I think there's a lot of opportunity to think about a range of options. You know, you don't need a two-year-old necessarily to, two-year-olds don't have ID, <laughs> large, you know, largely. Um, you know, so a lot of this, I think, happen, could happen at the device level. Um, I've seen, you know, various ways of describing it, whether we're using tokens, whether we're using some form of digital certificate. You know, as a parent, I, you know, I am providing my kid with a device. I should be able to kind of set that device um, to their age level and have the device help me as a parent kind of govern what they have access to and what they don't. And I think that's probably a very appropriate strategy for much younger kids and maybe up to about, you know, tween ages. You know, teens will probably be a different story. But again, you know, I think if you look at the proposed, at, at the legislation that was signed, you know, there's, it's not necessarily about this high stakes, you absolutely have to, without a shred of doubt, you know, verify whether someone is under 18 or not 18. And it's, I think there's really an opportunity with some of the um, proposals that Sarah was talking about, for example, to allow some more like lower stakes authentication potentially, you know, whether you have to know somebody is the person they say they are, or simply is this person, does this person have a high likelihood of being under the age of 18? You know, do I have to actually like certify that they are within a particular age range, or is it just a certainly enough to know that I have someone who's not an adult? So I don't think it has to be quite so absolutist. Um, and my, my faith in this area is really that we see some innovation on the part of third parties in this space. Obviously, in the, in the U.S., we're not going to get the federal government or even the state governments most likely involved with, with actually being a age provider, the way we've seen some of these proposals talked about in the EU, for example. Um, but I'm also very bullish on the idea of data intermediaries in general as a solution for holding and managing our data rather than always being in the paradigm of having to offload our data or have our data being managed by the platforms themselves. So, you know, to the extent that uh, I've been working on this issue in terms of thinking through how do we reshape the entire data ecosystem so that all my data doesn't reside with the Facebooks and the Googles, but rather resides under more directly under my control, I think verifying age, you know, again, can be something else that we think about in that context. And again, it doesn't have to be this absolute. I think it could be you know, a range of op opportunities that can go from very lightweight, you know, to that absolute, I must know that is Jennifer King accessing the site and what my precise age is versus, you know, that I'm part of a larger demographic. Um, Sarah, can you talk a little bit more? Thank you, Jen. Can you talk a, a little bit more about the idea of this uh, intermediaries, those trusted third parties? And, um, and the combination of the fact, because I think my next question would have been, well, are they, you know, what happens if there are legal requests from governments for information from them? But I think at least some of the laws are saying that these intermediaries would also not hold on to the information that they collect, that they would collect the information, do the verification, and then delete it immediately. Is, is that your sense as well? Yeah, I mean, I do think that there, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure about the state of the art on the proposals, but as far as what is technically possible, um, I certainly think that uh, having a third party intermediary, I mean, as, as Jen is saying, like, she's bullish on this, I actually like have some other concerns about like having a bunch of people collecting like a bunch of data for a variety of things. But I think for 
I think if we're taking the idea of age verification for a narrow purpose, and actually, I'm not sure I think that the framing of sort of high stakes versus not high stakes age verification is necessarily what we want here in talking about the technical solutions, because I think that um, a less invasive form of age verification. So, so let me actually just comment on sort of the, the dystopian narrative that, um, that Eric provided. I don't think that any of us panelists are proposing a world where each website individually is trying to scan the face of everybody who's accessing the website. I, I think that face scanning is not totally a straw man um, proposal because it's a real proposal. Um, I've only ever seen it in the context of a third party. I still think that there are things we can do that's better than face scanning, even with the case of a third party. But I think that this idea of all these shady websites are like taking photos of me. I just don't think that that's, I don't think there's appetite for that. I don't think that there's a proposal for that. Um, so I think that that from, from a what is technically possible as far as um, reducing the, you know, making it as unlikely as possible that a person's online behavior can be tracked as a result of age verification requirements. Um, I think getting, you know, a QR code that is uniquely yours, but is not attached to your identity. So something that you pick up at a gas station where they sell you the, the card, but your, but but they don't scan the card when giving it to you. So they don't associate your, your credit card or whatever ID. You know, there's no connection between you and the code that you get. That code effectively works almost like something cryptographic where it's something that is yours, but nobody really knows that it's yours. It gives you access to stuff. And, um, and I think even not requiring third parties to delete information, that's still a pretty privacy sound strategy what those third now what what would be useful is to make sure that the third parties are not holding information about all the websites that you visit using that code because the the accumulation of information about everywhere that you're visiting that becomes rich enough data that oftentimes can um, can be tied back to an individual um, but it can be a one way transmission it can be um, a website says hey, this person is trying to access, um, you know, check whether this, whether this code is valid. And that can be really siloed so that there's not sharing going on between those. So, so I think that that is a pretty viable solution technologically and also with minimal privacy concerns associated with it. Now, I think that it's not super applicable to, um, to the, the, use case that Jen was describing in kind of describing the age appropriate design code, where that is really focusing on it is the sites that are that are targeted toward children um, or sites that children are accessing frequently where age verification is going to be useful. So I think that proposal um, about having a third party that just checks that you have a code that certifies you as an adult and that's it and there's kind of nothing else going on. I think what that's useful for is is um, helping people access a very limited range of sites that bar minors from those sites. And as far as the flip side of it, I'm, I'm, not, so, I'm not so versed in, um, in what the right technology is for, for confirming, for example, that somebody is a minor and, and having a different version of Instagram or Snapchat um, available to them. I'm, I just haven't thought about that enough to, to have kind of an opinion at the offset about that. So I wanted to throw in something um, from an article that I think is really relevant to our conversation. This is from September 22nd of this year. It's an article by the French National Commission for Information Technologies and Civil Liberties, known as the CNIL. Um, it's titled Online Age Verification, Balancing Privacy and the Protection of Minors. And this is a direct quote. The CNIL has analyzed several existing solutions for online age verification, checking whether they have the following properties. I think this is important. Back to the quote. Sufficiently re reliable verification, complete coverage of the population, and respect for the protection of individuals' data and privacy and their security. The CNIL finds that there is currently no solution that satisfactorily meets these three requirements. It therefore calls on public authorities and stakeholders to develop new solutions following some recommendations that they give. Um, they say elsewhere in the same article, the CNIL finds that current systems are circumventable and intrusive 
and calls for the implementation of more privacy-friendly models. Um, a couple of things here. One is that, again, for the current uh, regulators and legislators, so far, apparently, we don't have systems that would satisfy an organization like the Canil, but they also don't say, um, you know, it's impossible. And they also don't say what some critics call say call uh, nerd harder. They, they actually offer. They've worked with you know privacy uh, protection um, with the. Um, I apologize with academics work in privacy protection technologies, and they've developed certain recommendations. So I'm wondering, um, Eric, when you read something like that, are you still left sort of feeling like this is just not doable, or or do you think we're just not there yet? where we can actually achieve the goals um, that that these proposals try to get to, but without undermining everybody's privacy. So I just want to go back. I mentioned this 1996 bill, uh, the Communications Decency Act, and the 1997 court opinion rejecting it uh, constitutionally, um, because at that time in 1996, there were pundits saying age authentication was possible online, um, and there was a range of options. There was credit card verification. There was a proposal about self-tagging, about uh, uh, you know basically like self-rating of content. Um, and uh, and we're still here today, 25 years later. We have things that that look like they can do age verification, and yet each of them has some structural barrier to. Uh, to success. Um, and so, but I, I'm a little bit confused about all this because this is not a hypothetical question. Is age uh, verification, authentication, or inference available, um, uh, you know, uh, going to be workable? The law that California passed comes into effect January 1, 2024. So in uh, 13 months, we have to have an answer to this question. Either there's something that we adopt or the law cannot be complied with. And so, you know, it isn't, well, it doesn't matter what will develop, you know, uh, uh, 10 or 20 years from now. California said we have to have an answer January 1, 2024. And if we agree with Keneal, we actually don't have a good answer to that very practical question that shapes the fifth largest economy in the world today. We don't even know how to answer that. I do want to mention one other thing. Sarah's mentioned the idea that you could go to a grocery store gas station and buy a, a token, uh, you know, a unique identifier, or Jenna uh, talked about some device level management. Um, I just want to be clear, um, all those are incredibly gameable, right? Those are so circumventable. Um, and so we really do have to ask the question, if those are the solutions that are so easily circumvented, um, uh, you know, it, are we really, what are we, what problem are we solving if that's the case? So, I think we need something more industrial grade than that. I think Jen uh, uh, mischaracterized what I said when she implied it was talking about it has to be perfect. No, it doesn't. The statute makes that clear. It doesn't have to be perfect. The point is, that I've been raising is that it changes the fundamental nature of the internet because we'll be asked to do whatever technology is being used every time we want to go to visit a site that has to comply with the law. And so if those checkpoints are set up throughout the internet, that is a change that's structural in nature that's going to affect every single person, adult and kids, how they engage with the internet. Um, and then what further consequences follow from that might also be awful. But I think even that alone, that very fundamental um, uh, checkpoint model, that's the, the, the crisis that we need to be managing. Um, because I think everyone who's on this call is going to be really shocked when they start realizing on January 1, 2024, they can no longer just freely click on the internet the way they've been used to. Jen, can I ask you, one of the questions from the audience is, I'm, I'm going to summarize it, but basically, um, while parental controls are not perfect, aren't they better than, quote unquote, hobbling the internet? Why are we not you know, asking the parents to do this kind of gatekeeping rather than the content providers? Right. Um, so I, I mean, I, I think that should be part of the solution, to be clear. I really don't, um, I don't want to see this implemented at the website level where every website has to engage in their own kind of, you know, verification process, um, a la, you know, what we have with cookie pop-ups. I mean, I think that's a terrible solution um, and not necessary, um, ultimately. Um, yeah. And I think what we're seeing, too, is, uh, you know, there's increased pressure on device makers um, in particular to step up and really try to give parental controls um, and real like 
actual solutions on devices that parents can work with. You know, I am a parent of a 13 year old and a nine year old, and I have a PhD in information science and parental controls drive me insane. <laughs> Absolutely insane in terms of managing them. I have such empathy for people who have no technical expertise and they try to manage them. It is nuts. Um, and you know, I would like to see uh, you know, a device level uh, control delegate a lot of this authority out of the hands of the sites having to do it themselves, such that you know, if I set my kid's iPad and give a particular age range on it, that they don't have access to either particular apps or those apps have to you know, understand that they are of a particular age and treat them differently. You know, and I think, you know, we, you know, we're, we've been talking a lot about websites and I think apps are a really, you know, important piece of this. And again, you know, as parents, you know, we generally control the devices that our kids are using, especially young kids. And that's where I do think there's a real advantage to thinking about these solutions, um, especially for younger kids at the device level. Question that I think maybe Eric or Sarah might, well, actually any of you might be able to answer, but um, since one of the proposals is to use the sort of uh, information that uh, some sites are already collecting so much information that they can kind of uh, estimate, you know, your age, um, uh, an audience member asked, wouldn't using existing profiling information to estimate age violate the law because profiling by default should not be done on a child? So does that kick that method out for children? Uh, I mean, the law says, you know, in California, uh, you cannot profile kids. Um, uh, so it does seem uh, contradictory, but I don't actually think that's a serious option that I'm expecting industry to adopt. I really think the more likely options are the documented um, review or the uh, the facial scans to uh, do age estimation. So I, I doubt that's likely to be where the action is. Um, but if it were, then the bill has structural problems. Um, I, I think um, the the Canela article that I mentioned was interesting because it envisioned a series of third parties, which is not something I've I've heard a lot discussed in terms of the California law as a proposal. So there would be one third party that connect, collects identifying information, and then one then transmits it, and then the third third party um, is the one that receives it. So there would be a lot of um, breaking down and siloing of who is this person? What age are there? What websites are they accessing? Um, it's it's pretty complex, and I don't think again it's it it hasn't been done yet. And even the Canil says they don't know how to do that effectively yet. But that's a very different option than the was that we've heard discussed when we talk I mean, about the party again, series. Just to clarify, yeah. right? That won't be ready January 1, 2024. So great. That's a theoretical model, just like we were discussing theoretical models in 1997 that never came to pass. Um, but you know, the more that you talk about these third party uh, vendors who are going to be performing whatever age verification assurance we have, like who are these people? How do we know that we can trust them? And most importantly, how do we teach kids to know when they can trust one of those sites versus not? Because the whole point being that kids might have reduced judgment, they might not be in the position to make the kinds of adult decisions um, that we expect um, uh, people to be able to protect themselves. So like, how, what are the risks that any of those are going to be operated by adversarial governments? What are the risks that they're going to be operated by companies that are engaged in commercial spam? And in all cases, even if they say they're not collecting data, how do we know that? And even if they aren't, if anyone can intercept in real time, they are a honeypot for the worst actors to be able to siphon off of whatever information they're seeing and put it into uh, a, a, into their own uh, tool chest uh, to weaponize. So, you know, like we just wave, the, you know, uh, these reports will just wave the magic wand, like somehow we're going to be able to trust these entities. And I, that's like a major, major social and technical challenge to come up with a rule set, the, uh, you know, to come up with a system that actually we can trust enough that we trust that kids can decide whether or not to present whatever information they're being asked to present um, in a way that uh, uh, reflects their reduced uh, 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 non-adult judgment. 
Uh, agreed. And the Keneal actually said that standards would have to be developed for these third parties to meet and that before the creation of such standards, none of this should be implemented. So to your point, this is a, a, a ways down the line. I want to make sure because we could keep talking about this for many hours, but I want to give each of you a chance just for concluding comments um, about any of the things we've talked about. And maybe we'll start again with you, Jen. Sure. Um, just to say, I mean, I think um, one of the things that we really haven't, I think, really acknowledged today is, you know, we we are talking about the status quo as if it is a kind of superior uh, state of being. And I think that there's a lot of good evidence that a lot of us feel like the status quo on the internet really sucks, to use a um, technical word, um, you know, and that there is a great deal of harm um, potentially experienced by children in across a variety of different contexts. You know, as a parent, I have this as a constant concern. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of interesting work coming out of um, mostly academia at this point, but a lot of folks trying to rethink the kind of fundamental structures of the internet. Um, you know, we've long needed to do that from a security perspective. We also need to do it from a privacy perspective. I think this is just one more uh, sign of where we really fundamentally need to move away from the internet architectures that we've had for the past 30 years to you know, more robust options that allow us to think about security and privacy by default. And I agree with Eric that, you know, there is nothing here, you know, that is going to be ready on January 1st, 2024. Um, and so in terms of this immediate bill, right, there are real concerns, but I think that this harkens towards, you know, these hard conversations that I think have been kind of punted down the road for a very long time that a lot of us in civil society and academia are really trying to grapple with because it's, it's time. Sarah, go ahead. Um, I, I guess I sort of am, am feeling like the conversation has just started, at least from my perspective. I haven't been writing blog or academic <laughs> commentary about, um, about this issue. Um, I think that uh, there has certainly been a lot of criticism around the idea of big tech companies with a ton of data should be involved with lawmakers and saying, and, you know, describing how they should be regulated. I actually think that that model is a good model as far as kind of driving conversation, not necessarily like the outcome. Um, but I think that, I, I think that that's, that's, that, can, that is going to be a piece of the, of the puzzle moving forward. So the people who are actually going to be doing the age verification, who are closer to what does this actually mean? Um, that allows you to, to think about how you can craft laws in a way that is technologically feasible and doesn't impose a time constraint before having a plan for how you're going to get there. And Eric. Um, so uh, one of the many criticisms I have about the age appropriate design code in California is that it doesn't provide an exception for parental consent. Um, it actually takes power away from parents and forces the businesses aside if someone's a kid or not, and then they must comply with this law, it doesn't matter whether or not the parents would agree to it or not. Um, and to me, I'm just shocked that that's what we think is in the best interest of children, that we're taking away parental control. Um, we should be fighting for ways to make sure that parents have the tools that they need in order to exercise their responsibility as parents, but then we should be empowering them. We shouldn't be trying to strip them of power. Um, I do want to comment on Jen's uh, observation that the status quo isn't working. Um, I, I don't agree with that, but I don't actually really need to make my case for that to say that the, the solution to the status quo not working is not to adopt a structural change to the internet that we don't actually even know if it would work or not at its most core levels of protecting children online. We're just guessing that it might without even contemplating fully the downsides. And to me, that is why um, I'm so uh, uh, upset about the embrace of these um, age verification crimes. We don't actually know if they solve any of the problems that lead Jen to say that the status quo isn't working. And if we can't answer that very fundamental question and we change the internet structurally, we're running a society-wide experiment that might actually be even worse than whatever you think the status quo is leading us to. And that's something that breaks my heart. 
So I think one interesting thing is that there are also proposals for ways of sandboxing regulatory responses and seeing if they work before they get implemented at uh, at internet scale. And I, I wish we had more time. I also am personally sad that we didn't get to the part that Eric had sort of led to about the changing of norms on the internet. Um, I do think that that there are a lot of norms that are changing and um, there are really interesting implications to the age verification requirements. We don't know yet how they're going to play out and we can probably have a follow-up program to, to look at this once things start getting implemented. I wanna thank our panelists so much for their participation um, on, on a topic that I think is not discussed enough and I really appreciate your input and thank all of you for joining us. And uh, hopefully we'll see you at future events. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.